see me, you Stevie. Wondering how I reach more evolutions than Eevee and make it look easy. What is up, Earth's Mightiest Subscribers? It's Blur Without Fear. Welcome back to the channel. All right, today's video. I actually want to take a moment to sit down and talk about something that I feel needs to be discussed, and I feel like not enough people talk about it, at least not in a way that actually makes any damn sense. And I know, yes, there have been critics. People have been hypercritical about the X-Men's Krakoa era. But the thing is, they're critical of it for completely different reasons than what I am. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and just put this out here right now. The Krakoa era needs to end. And I'm not saying that because I don't like it. I want to make sure I say this up front because I know there's going to be some people be like, oh, Blurred, you're just a hater. You're just a hater on the X-Men Krakoa era. You're always just shitting on X-Men Krakoa this, Krakoa that. Which is kind of funny considering I've literally dedicated a large portion of my channel to the X-Men's Krakoa era. And I've by and large been pretty glowing of it but the thing is that doesn't mean there aren't some things going on systemically underneath the surface of it and i want to make sure i'm clear on this i'm not saying that these things are you know quotey fingers bad i'm pointing out something that is a reason why it needs to end i know there are people who are thinking that i'm saying oh yeah 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 fire you you jerry doug and kieran gill and cy spurrier and you whoever else has been writing x books as of late no that's not what i'm saying even though technically all these people are moving on to other gigs after this is all over no what i'm saying is is that Krakoa was designed to be problematic Krakoa was designed to have issues i know a lot of people went into this thinking that oh Krakoa is supposed to be perfect it's supposed to be safe it's supposed to be the best day ever and that's kind of the point and i feel like people just lack media literacy and don't really know how to accept story elements it's kind of like one of those things where i always hear people complain about oh man they're just being really heavy-handed with this message well the reason why is because people don't get the message a lot of the times so they have to be more heavy-handed with it but at the end of the day i say all this because you have to recognize sometimes that when there's something placed in a story it's not because it's propping that up i know a lot of people when they got into the krakoan era some people didn't like it because they felt like some of the things that were going on some of the things that were being perpetuated were being propped up and treated as though they're good things and no they weren't it's kind of like when you watch a movie that has a we'll just say child predator it's not that the movie is trying to say ooh child predator good no they're trying to say child predator bad and they're trying to show you why just because something's in a story doesn't mean that it's being promoted getting back to the x-men stuff and getting to Krakoa, why i just said all that is because there are definitely a lot of things that are wrong with Krakoa, and that's why it needs to fall i know people get so angry when i you know, you talk about this in any way shape form or fashion i don't even like being on uh uh x spoilers on twitter anymore because this, i've met some really nice people there, but I have also met far more dumb people on that side of things. And I say that because these people like are crying and whining. Oh, why does Grokoa have to go away? Oh, blah, 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 blah. They, the X-Men can't have nothing. Here's the thing. When you tell a story, no story where the characters are having a good time. There's nothing wrong. Everything's perfect. Those stories aren't going to sell. And I'm going to tell you why. Because there's no conflict. And when there's no conflict, you have to create a conflict. And it's very difficult to create conflict in a conflictless vacuum. <laughs> you just can't do it. And, and if you do, it's going to seem contrived. And that was kind of the thing. When Groko was founded, it was awesome at first because we saw mutants up on high. They were placed at the head of the table. They were doing their own thing. They were stepping out on their own. They weren't allowing people to step on them anymore. But here's the problem with that. With that came arrogance. And we saw this. We saw the arrogance. The X-Men just literally, and I'm gonna say X, I'm gonna say X-Men a lot, because even though when I'm just talking about mutants as a whole, because you know sometimes that term is just kind of interchangeable. But the X-Men <laughs> became incredibly arrogant. I remember it was a, a complaint a lot of people had about the X-Men in that early, you know, Dawn of X era of the House of X uh, run. How are they not prepared for this? How did they not think this was gonna happen? And the thing is, when you, you step outside of yourself, it's really easy to, you know, from an outside looking in perspective, look at a story and be like, oh, I don't know why so-and-so did just do this. It's kind of reminds me of what people do when you watch a horror movie. Oh, if it was me, I wouldn't go in the house. And it's like, well, if you don't go in the house, there's no story. Like, I, it's a common complaint I hear people make about horror movies and oh, well, why don't they just leave? Well, why don't they just go do this? Here's the thing, if people made wise decisions, all the stories in the world 
would be boring. It, it, it would literally go, okay, well, the X-Men created Krakoa and they lived happily ever after. There's nothing else after that. Okay. You can't do that. That's a dumb way to tell a story. The, the whole happily ever after doesn't exist. It's not real. It's probably the most unrealistic thing and, and, and would be the most unrealistic thing about a story that involves characters with superpowers. But to get down to it, one of the biggest problems with Krakoa was inequality. I've talked about this a great deal, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time harping on it, but one of the things people don't even pay attention to is the fact that the Morlocks, they were treated differently. And I, I, when I say Morlocks, I'm kind of more speaking about a specific group, but I'm also technically speaking about people who aren't even associated with the Morlocks. Like any mutant whose power makes them visibly look different than a normal human. A lot of those characters were treated differently because they couldn't pass for human. And it was something that's even talked about in Victor Laval's Sabretooth and Sabretooth and the Exiles. Uh, it was even talked about in uh, New Mutants uh, to a uh, degree or another, and maybe even a couple of other books. But yeah, it was one of those deals where, yeah, there were mutants who were treated differently. Not everybody was equal on an island where they're supposed to be equal. And the Morlocks, more specifically the actual social group, the Morlocks, they didn't feel safe because suddenly the very people who tried to kill all of them, namely speaking of the original uh, marauders, they were all just walking around on the island just as free as they please. Just, yeah. Imagine you being nearly slaughtered, like everyone, like all your friends and family, nearly slaughtered down to the last person. And suddenly you're hanging out on this island where, man, everything is supposed to be wine and roses, unicorns and rainbows. And suddenly in walks one of the people who killed your best friend, killed your, your mom, your significant other, somebody close to you, maybe everybody close to you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Like no one's gonna do anything about it. They're like, nah, man, you gotta let that go. It's all for the greater good. That was a problem. And, not a, and once again, not a problem because it was bad in, in terms of storytelling, but it was a problem because it shows that Krakoa wasn't perfect. It wasn't. Matter of fact, you take it even further, uh, the inequality that characters that were clones and you know, characters that were from you know, an alternate reality or uh, you know, a time, they were time displaced in some other way. There was issues with that because, well, maybe less so in the case of time displaced characters, unless you were a character who's like, let's say you exist in this reality, but maybe there's a future version of you who came back. If that future version of you died, by and large, the general rule was that that person wouldn't be resurrected on Krakoa, despite the fact that resurrection was readily available and you know, not a, a finite resource. I mean, it, it's finite in so much as if you lose any of the people who are capable of uh, doing it, it goes away. But I mean, it wasn't like they couldn't just keep doing it. You know, they had ways to make it happen. If you were a clone of somebody, it was originally believed you would not be resurrected. This was done away with in uh, Vita Ayala's New Mutants in regards to the character of Gabby Kenny, a uh, scout who is a clone of Lara Kenny. But yeah, they didn't go that route. Eventually it was like, oh no, these people, they are distinct enough that they should be allowed, you know, to exist on the island like you know we, we're gonna do away with that rule but that was a rule for a good chunk of the Krakoan era up to recently this is something that only really was done away with in the last year of a story that's been brewing for about four now you're probably thinking okay well yeah that's one thing yeah that's one set of things okay cool whatever well here let's let's get to one I've actually been talking about more recently and something I do think should be used as a storytelling point going forward uh once the House of X era is over and something I think if it does not pay dividends down the road and it was a it was a wasted story arc and that is something that cropped up on the Cy Spurrier side of things in Way of X and this was when we learned that there were children who were just being abandoned on the island because you know one of the rules was make more mutants and you know what that means that means we need to have a little more you know cheek clapping you had a little more cheek clapping and with the cheek clapping you know what comes with cheek clapping cheek clapping brings babies into the world and we were learning there were people who were just out there just doing that left and right and having babies and they're just dumping them on the island leaving them there was even instances where there were children who were revealed to have just been hidden in bushes on Krakoa and they even had a nursery, uh, I believe it's called the Hatchery. Uh, I'm just, you know, once again, I'm talking off the top of my head here. This is all just kind of 
off the dome. But I do remember the storyline. And yes, uh, there were instances where these children, they had to be taken care of by somebody. And it wasn't the parents. And we even saw this over in Victor Laval Sabretooth. There was a character with Third Eye who, once again, we don't really know why he was exiled from Krakoa, but he is listed as having broken that law of make more mutants. So it could only be for one of two reasons. Either A, he made a mutant and that mutant was aborted or he refused to make more mutants uh, for one reason or another. And I think the former is more likely than the latter. But one of the things he pointed out was that. He talked about that. That was the thing that he brought up was the random mutants just being born on the island and nobody taking care of them. Uh, this even came up in Benjamin Percy's X-Force where there was a young child, uh, I believe his name is Maximilian, who is one of those very children. A very powerful mutant, mind you. Uh, and yeah, just abandoned, out in the cold. But the fact that a nursery had to be created just so these kids didn't die, it says a lot. Also, one thing I thought was kind of a, uh, an issue as well was keeping Moira a secret. Now, granted, we knew why they kind of had to do this because, you know, technically, if Moira were to be you know, unalived for whatever reason, then the timeline would reset and undo everything they had built up to that point. Nobody wanted to lose that, so that was definitely a thing. But one issue is that if Moira would not have been obfuscated, you know, so much, maybe things actually would have been okay. I mean, yeah, sure, maybe word would have gotten out, but at the same time, there were characters who were not clued in that probably should have been. Characters like Emma Frost. This came up during Inferno, especially at a point where Xavier and Magneto realized maybe they should have clued her in. And by the time they did, they waited so long that this broke the trust between Emma Frost and Xavier and Magneto because she felt like she was finally being given a fair chance. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, she had been a member of the X-Men, but you know, she was still one of those characters that you know, Xavier and Magneto still felt they needed to keep her at arm's length. And you know, she felt that she was finally, finally getting that seat at the table. And really, she wasn't. She was being left out. And you know, because they felt that maybe they couldn't trust her with this. And who's to say it would have changed anything? But it just showed that there was a very deep lack of trust. Case in point, the fact that there was even a quiet council, a ruling body who people knew who they were, but I mean, they didn't really you know, share their thoughts and beliefs with everyone on the island. They were making deals and making rules in secret without really consulting anybody else. If anyone could have benefited, if any nation could have benefited from a democratic turn, uh, yeah, and what I just mean, I'm not talking about a political party, I'm just talking about having democratically elected leaders, it would have been Krakoa. Another issue that, you know, and this kind of goes back to the arrogance, but also the carelessness of, you know, you know the Krakoa era X-Men is just leaving Wolverine's lying around. We've actually seen the fruit of those more recently that uh, whenever Wolverine has died, his adamantium skeleton is left behind. And we have seen Orcus make good use of that, using his adamantium skeletons that have been left laying around to turn them into Wolverine-sized sentinels. That's kind of problematic. I mean, it's it's kind of dumb. And honestly, leaving any mutant behind, and I think that's why the X-Men have had so many problems. They don't they don't go back and recover the bodies. They don't go back, like hell, we saw that uh, in a couple of instances of X-Men Red and I believe Inferno, where we saw that Nightcrawler, there is a Nightcrawler that is you know, being hung up on the Phobos base that Orcus has up there uh, right next to Mars. And yeah, he's just sitting there encased in you know, some tank, just dead. Yeah, just cause. Because you know, they never bothered to go back and get these bodies. And you know, there's also, you talk about that too, we also gotta talk about the fact that you know, a lot of the characters don't remember how they died, why they died, or anything else for that matter. In Inferno, it was actually brought up that the mutants kept attacking, and kind of attacking in the same ways, going after the Orcus base. Uh, you know, just was out there away from Earth. And it was kind of heavily implied that the reason why they kept doing it was because they don't remember how they did it the last time. They don't have any communication out that far either. That was something that was established during House of X number four, that once they went to the Orcus base, it was so far away from Earth that no telepath could even really reach that far. And even then, even when they did, like Jean was one of the only, the only one that could. And even then, she just barely did it. And yeah, it just, it just goes to show that the system was flawed. And the fact that people were being resurrected with no real knowledge of what came before. We saw this happen with Domino, how she told Colossus that she wanted to remember everything that Zeno had done to her. And well, granted, Colossus was a sleeper agent for Mikhail Rasputin at the time. Still, 
it was interesting to me that you know yeah this is something that you know, he he just kind of decided no I'm not gonna allow you to remember and it was largely because Kyle Rasputin was working with Zeno and she would be able to name names and that's why that all happened but at the same time had she been able to keep her memories a lot of the stuff that happened to them wouldn't have happened and you know once again I'm not you know these aren't story criticisms I'm just pointing out that this is the reason why Krakoa had to go down you have to go all the way to the top the higher up you go the harder the fall is when you come down that's why the X-Men Hellfire Gala of last year, why it was such a gut punch to so many readers, because you were too invested. And not to say you, that was a bad thing, but you were so invested that you forgot, oh wait, this is a story. Something bad has to happen eventually. The bill has to come due eventually. And here we are. Also, not even done yet. We gotta talk about the exiles. The exiled mutants. That was something that was also a problem. Krakoa was supposed to be a place that had no prisons, and yet they made one, and it was called The Pit or the whole, as I like to call it sometimes. But yes, it is kind of funny to me because so many characters were put in the pit simply for being themselves. Meanwhile, other mutants who have been far more problematic were just walking around as brazen as they please. Case in point, Sabretooth, who was the first exile into the pit, and he was put into the pit for killing humans, which to be fair, not a good thing, but the rule of kill no man had not even been implemented. And yet, they decided to sentence him retroactively and hide him away. And while yes, Victor Creed is no saint. Sabretooth is not a saint. We're not, I'm not sitting here saying that, oh man, woe is Victor Creed. But here's the thing, no matter how you slice it, that was a commentary on no matter how bad a person is, there is a wrong way to administer justice. And that was a wrong way to do it because it was convenient for them. They, they did that because it was convenient to them and it required them to really do nothing. It was the laziest administration of justice I think you will probably ever see in the history of storytelling. And once again, doesn't make it a bad way to tell the story. I'm just saying, it made the characters look really lazy and that was kind of the point. It was the whole deal of, we're trying to do the absolute least as the Quiet Council and it showed. To the point that even when they created the Hellions, knowing that there were problem mutants on the island, mutants who either by virtue of their powers or their personalities, that they just didn't work on the island. And they created the Hellions, basically the mutant version of the Thunderbolts. Yet, even that fell by the wayside because they just couldn't be bothered. Having characters like Grey Crow, Nanny, Orphan Maker, Psylocke, so on and so forth, all these characters that they just felt you know, hey, these, these people are causing problems on the island. Wild Child's just killing Dr. Cecilia Reyes every single time, or at least attempting to try and kill her every single time. It's it's come time for him to take his medicine. You know, it just, it's it's a thing. It's a thing. And instead of trying to help these people, I mean, technically in some ways, creating the Hellions was kind of their way to try and help these people. But when these characters did the thing that ultimately they are only known to do, they still held them accountable for it. Characters like Orphan Maker, who killed humans in an attempt to try to save Nanny. In the case of Toad, who, while well, he wasn't a part of the Hellions, but he admitted to having killed Wanda Maximoff, AKA the Scarlet Witch, despite the fact he actually didn't kill her. It was Magneto that killed her. And once again, this was all done in an effort to secure the creation of the waiting room, which by the way, is a good thing. It allows mutants to just come back whenever they want to, regardless of a Cerebro backup or not. But still, Toad took the L and Magneto watched him do it. At no point did Magneto say, yeah, no, actually it was me. I mean, he, I'm sure he wanted to, but it just goes to show that the criminal justice system of Krakoa just does not work because Toad should not have had to go through that. I mean, yeah, you know, killing Wanda Maximoff is wrong, but I feel like why the lies? Why the obfuscation? I mean, I know part of it was because Wanda felt that the mutants would not accept her gift if it came just directly from her, but... It's one of those deals where, yeah, it just goes to show that mutant kind was being incredibly from being resurrected because Moira didn't want her resurrected because Destiny would know exactly what Moira was going to do. And while that is a whole other issue in of itself, Xavier Magneto manipulating Mystique, even killing her uh, one or two times just to wipe her memory so they forget the conversations that they had. That goes back to something I said earlier regarding resurrections. You know, like I said, there's a lot of problems there. There's a lot of problems. Uh, and you know, despite all this, Beast, 
up until recently was allowed to run roughshod on the island, do whatever he wants, reverse engineer the teleferonics, completely destabilize an entire nation in Terra Verde, and as well as you know, indiscriminately assassinating people across the globe using Wolverine, and in other cases, clones of Wolverine. So he even made an entire Death Star where he was you know, keeping humans, mutants, aliens, whatever, imprisoned and was experimenting on them. And Xavier, while he technically knew nothing about it, it was because he didn't care to know. He didn't want to know. And once he found out, he was appalled. But the thing is, he kind of knew what he was getting into, going into it. And once again, that's corruption, gross corruption at best. And then, you know, kind of going back to the arrogance, you know, the whole thing, Magneto. Uh, you know, telling humans they had new gods now. Yeah, the Krakoa could have gone a completely different way if they decided to work with humanity. And granted, they've kind of tried that in the past and it didn't really work out. So, you know, of course, you're going to try this way instead. But I do find it interesting that, you know, there were so many people who were upset about the fact that, uh, you know, Magneto uh, was proven wrong. That, you know, humans did not have new gods now. And the thing is, I always kind of felt that line, while it was definitely a, a, a G check, it was definitely funny to read. It is something that I feel like if actually happened in real life, a lot of people wouldn't be too kind on that. Uh, you know, if some uh, you know, group of people decided that they were better than everybody else, and you know what we call that, that's called supremacy. You know, uh, fill in the blank supremacy. If, you know, let's say if mutants were real and mutants decided that, yeah, we're better than normal humans, we're going to take over, we're your new gods now. Even if they didn't say they were going to take over anything, but they just said... If they said to humans, we are your new gods, I guarantee you there'd be very many of you who would probably not feel too great about that. And it would probably inspire you in some way, shape, form, or fashion to hit back, even if you didn't think you'd win. I mean, yeah, it's terrible, but that's just how, that's just how this works. And, you know, Magneto, being who he is, you know, it made sense for him. It was very on brand for him to say. It's not like Magneto had never been a bad guy before, but yeah. I feel like a lot of people missed the message on that. It was that honestly right there in that first issue of House of X number one, that should have been the first sign that it was all going to come crashing down like a ton of bricks. And it needs to. It really does. Not because I don't like it, not because I don't enjoy it, but because it's run its course. And something like this can't exist forever. And it shouldn't because the promise of a place for all mutants where everyone is equal, where everyone gets a fair shake, where everyone gets to be themselves, where no one has to live in fear. If, in fact, none of those things are actually true, then it's a lie. And if Krakoa is a lie, all lies, and you know, as my granny used to tell me, what's done in the dark eventually comes to the light, all of that has happened. So now it's time to sunset Krakoa. Well, I know a lot of you won't like that. <sighs> well, you're gonna have to get over that. You guessed it, obligatory channel outro time. If you're not subscribed to the channel, consider doing so. Clicking that subscribe button and tapping that notification bell ensures that you get more videos just like this one and you don't miss any of my other content that I drop throughout the week, plus, my live streams every Thursday and Saturday. And if you enjoyed the video, make sure you click that like button, keep it plus ultra, and sound off in the comments.